Well, I want to continue sharing on what I'm calling the ecosystem of faith, ecosystem of faith. And we've seen that there are different elements that make up and contribute to the environment of faith and having strong faith and, if you will, not fainting in your walk of faith because of these cooperative powers that work with our faith. A lot of people I've discovered have gotten a basic knowledge of faith and some foundational truths about faith and I thank God for those things. Probably the message of faith changed my life more than, more than anything I had ever heard. And so, man, I, I honor those that have shared before me on faith and, and the laws that govern faith and things of that nature. But a lot of people are struggling in this hour because I believe they don't understand these cooperative powers that work with our faith. And so we've seen that these powers are hope, and how important hope is in our lives and that faith doesn't have anything to bring substance to if you don't have hope and you don't understand the power of hope and how it connects to faith. Faith works in hope, Hebrews 11.1 1 says. And then love, God's love for us. Man, you've got people that have heard some principles about faith, but they have no idea how much God loves them. And Galatians 5, 6 says that circumcision doesn't avail anything or uncircumcision, but faith that works by love. Our faith works by love. As you see by revelation, God's love for you, faith just explodes in your heart and in your life. And then now we wanna look at the third cooperative power and that's patience. And this is where you lose the crowd. Because people don't wanna hear about patience and if they even take the step of faith to investigate patience, they want it right now. And we live in a very impatient world and one of the, one of the I believe, most challenging concepts about God in my personal life is his patience. I've asked him many a time, why are things the way they are and you not intervening in certain situations and James chapter five tells us why, how that God is so patient for the harvest and the former and the latter rain. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. And he is patient and steadfast in his loving kindness so that people can come to know him. He really doesn't want to judge anybody, even in final judgment. God wants everybody saved. I don't care what you've been taught. And he wills for everybody to be saved. And he's so patient for that harvest. There's a lot of things that happen in this earth that are confusing because of the long suffering of God. And even that is over the top of most people's heads. And yet I encourage you to read James chapter five. I don't think I'll get there. Verses seven through 12, even about the patience of Job. And even when we consider Job, Everywhere I go, when people talk about Job, all they consider is the beginning of Job and get it all messed up in the first place. And the Bible in the New Testament says, consider his end. Okay, let's just move on. Maybe it's good I don't get there, hallelujah. And how that God gave him back double everything the devil stole. Not what God did, but what the devil did. And he had to endure to inherit the promises of God, and that's what Hebrews chapter 6 says, verse 12, be not slothful, be not sluggish, don't be lazy, but followers of those who through faith and patience, everybody say patience, who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Did everybody see that at least on the screen if you don't have a Bible? Y'all didn't see that on the screen. It's on the screen, how many of you can see? Okay, how many of you see that on the screen? That's better, hallelujah. Because it's like, what Bible are we not reading? Because people talk about faith and they get weak in their faith and yet the scriptures are clear that it's through faith and patience you inherit the promises, not faith alone. Bible faith does not stand alone 
It works in hope, it works by love, and it works through faith. And if you think you're going to believe God for certain things and not have to endure a great fight of afflictions, you're in a drunken stupor. (laughs) I tried not to say those things. It just comes out before I could stop it. A drunken stupor! Sometimes I feel like as a pastor, I've just got to slap you with a Holy Ghost love slap out of this stupor of... We are living in a fallen world. There are demonic powers warring against us. And worse yet, people yielding to those powers. And when you begin to believe God and stand for the promises of God and believe for the promises of God to manifest in your life, you're going to have to endure some things. And I love you. And I, I, I like it when I have more time to drag something out. I can be nicer. But it's like, okay, I've got one more hour. And many of you, praise the Lord, just one little affliction and you give up. Just one minor attack, one little bitty dart of the devil hits your shield of faith and you collapse. And I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to encourage you that, look, We've got, to, we've got to understand some of these laws of faith. We've got to understand how this works and that we have to learn to stand. We have to learn to endure a great fly, a fight of afflictions. We have to overcome and let faith run its course to get us to our goal. We have a goal, healing. We have a goal, prosperity. We have a goal, our marriages. We have a goal, our church. We've got goals, we got hopes. And it's gonna take patience though to get to that goal and patience is the strength of faith. Patience is what allows you to get to the end and see the manifestation of what God gives you at the beginning of every journey. And yet many people do not understand this. They get mad at God, they blame the preacher. Don't go there, hallelujah. They, They... get discouraged and just faint. Hebrews chapter 12 says that we've got this great cloud of witnesses around us in verse one and that we need to run our race with patience. Patience. The word impatience means endurance, perseverance, long suffering, long suffering. Part of the definition of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is that love is kind and suffers long. Some of you suffer long, but you're not very kind. (laughs) Love and hope and patience is what allows us to suffer long and not only be kind, but rejoice. And I'll get into some of that and the dealing with our emotions here in just a minute because trials and tribulations do not feel good. And I wish I could say there's a point that you mature, that something bad happens, an affliction, a trial, a persecution, and you literally feel good. Like they're towing your car off in the parking lot, it's been repossessed and you feel something good, hallelujah. This is awesome. No, you won't feel good. When family comes against you, you won't feel good. And for years, I thought maturity would be I'd come to a place that I wouldn't be tempted to be discouraged in trials and afflictions. I, I would have my emotions so trained and exercised that I wouldn't have these negative feelings. And I was in a drunken stupor. And so let's go to Romans here, chapter five, because this is where God first taught me this. And all three of these elements are revealed in Romans chapter five, verses one through five. Romans chapter five, verses one through five. And the first time the Lord ever spoke this to me, I was reading these passages and all three of these cooperative powers just leaped off the page at me of hope, 
of love and patience. As a matter of fact, the first time the Lord ever showed this to me, he gave me the illustration in my mind of an atom, of an atom, which is the source of nuclear energy. It's where we get the concept and the understanding and the scientific insight to what a nuclear bomb is and how a nuclear bomb even works. And again, the basic atom is the source of nuclear energy, this atomic, this profound, powerful energy. And yet the elements that make up an atom are protons, electrons, and neutrons. And faith is the nuclear energy of the kingdom of God that'll blow mountains into the sea. But that atom of faith that is the source of spiritual nuclear energy, the energy of God Almighty, has neutrons, electrons, and protons. And they are hope, love, and patience. Somebody said, well, why didn't you give us that, inner, that, that picture and that introduction to this series? I just didn't feel comfortable blowing things up around here, hallelujah. <laughs> I thought an ecosystem would go over smoother. But it's the same principle. So watch these three now in connection to spiritual nuclear energy Energy that can blow a mountain into the sea in Romans 5 here. Verse 1, therefore having been justified by faith, there's, there's this energy, faith, that saves us. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace. We're saved and justified by this thing called faith. And now we have access into this amazing grace of God by this thing called faith. But notice this, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. See saints, there's a standing part of the Christian faith. There's a standing and not wavering. There's a, stand, a standing on what is right versus what is wrong. There's a standing on what is up and what is down. There's a standing on this is antichrist and this is Christ and I don't care how much I'm attacked at any level, I'm gonna stand. And how do I do that? By faith. And what, what is the protron of faith? It, uh, and that atom of faith, it's patience. Well, I... I there's so, so many things that was wrong with me coming up in the church. I, I, I labored as a teenager for years. I don't know where I got this concept. I'm not blaming preachers or the church. I don't know where I got it. But I had it in my head. If I do what is right, if I say what is right, then everybody will love me. Everybody will like me. Y'all didn't grow up in that, that drunken stupor. And I'll never forget, this is, this is embarrassing, but I remember the Lord speaking to me that he did everything right. He was love, God made flesh. You wanna know what love looks like? You look at Jesus. He was love. He did everything right. He thought everything right. He said everything right. And they killed him. Why do we think if we stand up for protecting our children from being groomed by pedophilia that everybody's going to go, these are good people, these are nice people that want to protect our children from pedophilia and grooming them for sexual perversion, that we're just not going to have that. Why do we think everybody's going to stand up and go, ar, 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 No, they'll, they'll picket our church. 
Amen. Amen. Praise God. I need to keep going. Now watch this. By faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in what? Hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we, saw, we also glory in tribulations. Hold the press. Are you telling me that God's calling me to rejoice in the midst of all this opposition, in the midst of all this afflictions and, and persecutions and yeah, yeah. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, which is patience. King James Bible says patience. And perseverance, character. And character, there it is again, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because uh-oh, there's the electron. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So you've got hope, you've got tribulation, and you've got love. And these are the cooperative powers that give you the faith to stand and give you the power from heaven itself to remove mountains in your lives. So we have to be schooled, we have to be taught, we have to be educated in the hope of the gospel and how the gospel gives us hope and in the love of God in the midst of a fallen world and that God loves you and how much he truly loves you and that you need to know it by revelation and that you have need of patience. And there's only one thing that works and produces patience. Tribulation. Now don't misunderstand me. I've got a revelation of this that I can almost make problems be a blessing from God. I'm not, I'm not advocating that God is the author of any of your tribulations, any of your persecutions, any of your afflictions. But he is the God that's with me, that empowers me in them and produces this thing called patience and character now in my life. And there's no getting around it. I guarantee you, saints, if we could get around tribulation, I'd be heading that way, dragging you with me. I kinda, I kinda grew up around some people that thought faith was problem avoidance. That if you had faith, you would avoid these problems. And if you had great faith, now listen to me, I love you, I'm not putting anybody down, but I heard things like, if you have great faith, you won't have these problems. And if you do have them, it's because you're weak in faith. I bet I'm not the only one within the sound of my voice. I'm hearing me and this is awesome. But I bet I'm not the only one that has been told or thought, if I just had more faith, I wouldn't be going through this. When in fact, it is your faith that positions you to go through that. This didn't happen for a lack of faith. This happened to me because of my faith. Amen. Amen. And you'll never mature till you learn to endure. Why are there so many immature Christians? Because they don't know how to endure a great fight of afflictions. They don't know how to endure the opposition to our faith. They don't know how to endure these afflictions, these tribulations, these persecutions. Go to James chapter one. James chapter one, verse two. My brethren, now I'm gonna break this down probably every word. <laughs> so we'll start with my brethren. So he's writing to Christians. He's not writing to the world. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to believers. He's talking to brothers and sisters. My brethren, count it all joy 
when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces, produces patience. The testing of your faith produces patience. A faith that is not tested is not the faith of God in your heart. Our faith gets tested. Knowing that the testing of your faith. <laughs> I used to take all the persecutions personally. I even took the afflictions personally. I used to think I'm doing something wrong if I've made somebody mad at me. Amen. And I thought I was being tested when the Bible says it's my faith that's being tested. Have you ever thought about this? I have. Why, when you believe God for something and release faith or exercise faith or make a stand in faith and all Hades breaks out and you doubt? Do you know when I was doubting, I never doubted. Where are you? I hear a real clap, not a welfare clap. I have never doubted when I'm doubting. I have never ever to this day doubted till I believed. I got to a point I started shouting every time I doubted because that means I'm believing. Because I didn't doubt when I was doubting. I'm doubting because I'm believing. My faith is being tested. You doubt because your faith comes under trial. And you have to learn to not doubt, to believe only. And that takes time. It takes patience. And that trial is producing, it's developing patience. This is really cool. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect or mature and complete, lacking nothing. Oh my goodness. That just excites me. My trial doesn't excite me, but where God's taking me excites me. My problem does not make me feel good, but boy, I have a joy unspeakable and full of glory in my heart and a thanksgiving, the sound and voice of faith coming out of my heart. I'm headed somewhere and I'm gonna ship the devil's saddle home in Jesus' name. I'm gonna put a hurting on him. I'm gonna put a hurting, put a hurting on him. Let's go back. My brethren, count it all joy. Count it all joy. You will not, as I stated earlier, when a problem, an affliction, a persecution, a trial hits, you're not going to automatically feel joy. And that confused me. I know you're not confused. You're as pure as the wind-driven snow. And why you're not up here sharing, I have no idea. Because we all know you're God's gift to humanity. I struggle. I, I waver. I get hit and it doesn't feel good. Now, I've, I've come a long way and I remember when I first started getting count, canceled on social media, it didn't feel good at first, but because of what I have learned, I tell you, I started rejoicing from the heart. I started giving God thanks because there's only one way the silicon, silicon tech gods would cancel me, and that is if I'm speaking the truth in love. So there's a point where you go, wait a minute, this is awesome. It doesn't feel good. But I count it all joy because they would never cancel me if, if, if I'm carrying the world's narrative. They would celebrate me. Amen. 
Well, I could say a lot and cause a nuclear bomb. No, I'm, I've got to go right after this service and catch a plane. And I don't want to look out the window and see a mushroom cloud over <laughs> this area. <laughs> because people and their faith is so weak, they cave immediately under pressure. This is what patience is. Patience, listen, is perseverance under pressure. When there's no pressure, you're not patient. Patience doesn't kick in till there's pressure. Count it all joy. You're not always going to feel great serving Jesus. Not everybody, again, is going to celebrate you if you love Jesus, if you're loyal to Jesus, if you're married to Jesus. People are married to politics. They're married to the woke movement. They're married to sexual perversion. They're married. And so when I bring these things up, I, to them, are attacking their spouses. But I don't know who you're married to, but I'm married to Jesus, hallelujah. I've been a spouse to the Lord, a virgin, in love for Jesus and with Jesus. And if they hated him, they will hate you. In this world, you shall suffer persecution, tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Amen. Man, I'll, I'll be honest with you again. I used to read that. <laughs> In this world, you shall, not maybe so, not, you never know. You shall suffer tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. <laughs> and I'd read that and I'd go, well, good for you, Jesus. I'm happy for you. Amen. But what about me? I know you've never thought like that. But how many of you know his victory over the world was your victory over the world? You have an identification with him now that you are no longer a victim, but you are a victor. Welcome to Victory Life. Welcome to a life of victory. I will not allow anyone to poison my children or grandchildren and condemn them and falsely accuse them or train them in school to be a victim. None of us are a victim except of our ignorance, our laziness, and our poor life choices. Otherwise, if you know Jesus, I don't care what color you are, I don't care how much money you have or don't have, I don't care what side of the tracks you were born on, I don't care if you was conceived in the back of a 56 Chevy, God Almighty has made you more than a conqueror through him and his love for you. You can either accept that as God's word and faith come, or you can believe the ungodly, fraudulent, deceptive words of this world. And it produced fear in you and worry in you and guilt in you and on and on it goes. You count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now look at this, this is important. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You can only count it all joy when you know something, not feel something. He didn't say count it all joy because I am going to take your emotions and I'm going to breathe on them and chicken skin is going to be all over you with every problem you face. No, he says, you better learn to count it all joy, knowing something, not feeling something. The only way this can be real and, and trust me, we have some issues in church culture with being real. A lot of people have some issues with so-called faith and being real. How is this really real, count it all joy? How can it really be real to really do it? 
that this pains me, this hurts me. How can it be real for me to count it all joy? I got to know something. And listen, if I don't know something, I'll never be able to count it all joy. What do I have to know? I have to know that this tribulation, though I hate it and it's painful and I don't like it, it's producing patience. And listen, I know this, patience is going to bring maturity of character in my life. Patience is going to hook up with my faith and I'm going to inherit the promises of God. See, if you don't know that, it's impossible for this to be real. Go back real quick to Romans. We started there, Romans 5. Let me just bring out something quick and then we'll move on. Same exact terminology that Paul used and James used. Romans 5 verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory, rejoice, count it all joy, in tribulation, look at this, knowing that tribulation produces patience. We count it all joy. We in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And the way it's real is we know something, not feel something. I have, I have lost friends that I love dearly just for making a stand and a biblical non-biased stand for righteousness and justice that surrounds the throne of God. What people call justice today is a perversion, just like what they call love is a perversion. The same people that don't know what love is and have perverted love have perverted justice. And they do evil in the name of justice. They hate in the name of justice. They burn cities down in the name of justice. And me simply bringing out the word that God's justice is pure. God's justice is non-bias. God's justice is executed in righteousness, what is right. And I've lost friends over quoting the Bible to deal with, okay, what is justice? I've lost friends of, well, what is equity? You got these, thank you, Jesus, for slapping my tongue. You got these, I'm not having a senior moment. I'm trying to say this nice. You, you, you've got these people that have no God sense. They have no common sense. Talking about equity. And when you listen to it, it is so unequitable, anybody born again ought to be able to see that's not equity. And we're not all equal. Uh oh. I think I'm losing some more friends. God created us different. We are not equal. We're equal under God in value and worth and to be loved. But you're in an ignorant flash if you think we're all equal. We have different IQs. We have different abilities. We have different strengths. We have different weaknesses. We're different. And difference good, not bad. And we should be in a constitutional republic established on Judeo-Christian principles. We should all be equal under the law. I'm equal under God in value, worth, love. And I should be in a constitutional republic established on Judeo-Christian principles equal under the law. In other words, what's wrong for you is wrong for me. And if you're gonna go to jail for that, I can't do that and not go to jail. Equity. 
Politicians, half of them, minimal. I, help me, Jesus. A minimal, minimal of them ought to be locked up. They're breaking the law. They're lawbreakers. They're, they're lawless. And they do things that if you and I did it, we'd go to jail. We're not equal under the law and we're devolving into a nation that doesn't even believe we're under God. So there won't be any equality under God either. And we'll self-destruct. Sin will kill us. Hallelujah. Where was I before I got on track? What was I talking about? That's exactly, I was testing you. I knew where I was. <laughs> Tribulation, you won't be able to count it all joy if you don't know something. What are we to know? This is working patience. I don't like it. It doesn't feel good, but it is producing patience and patience is with faith going to mature me and I'll be a person of integrity. I'll be a person of character. I'll be a person of equity. I'll be a person of justice. Amen. I'll do just and follow justice. Praise the Lord. I grew up under the misnomer of tribulation is what perfects us. Saints, if tribulation perfected us, I'd be looking at the epitome of perfection. You better laugh, Brian. I know some of your, your stuff. John, you better laugh too. Didn't mean to call any names. I didn't call your last name, so. <laughs> Problems do not perfect us or we'd all, I guarantee you by now, be perfect. I was told years ago, I, I was struggling with my size. I, my mother didn't weigh 100 pounds when she had me. And I'm just small bone, period. I'm just, and so I just got tired of shopping in the kids department for a jacket. And I did a lot of murmuring and complaining. Sue would want to go shopping and I'd have to go into the youth department to get a jacket that would fit me. So I just wanted a bigger chest. And a friend of mine heard me complaining about it and he said, well, get you some weights, just get some weights. And you'll have a bigger chest. I bought a set of weights and I watched them for a whole year. <laughs> and I didn't go from a 40 to a 41 or a 42. How many of you know weights will not build your muscles? Let it sink in. Weights will not build your muscles. You have to resist, submit. Resist, submit. Resist, submit. How many of you know the same book of James, chapter four, verse seven says, Submit to God, resist the devil. Submit to God, resist the devil. Submit to God, resist the devil. It's faith and patience that builds your spiritual muscles, not your problems. Hallelujah. Go to, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Powerful chapter. Wish we could go over more than I'm able to right now. But every one of us have to learn to submit to God, resist the devil. And it's in these problems, trials, afflictions, persecutions, listen, we're submitting to Jesus, resisting the devil, and patience is being produced. Spiritual muscles are being developed. Now, I know that's not good news to your flesh. You'd rather me lie to you. Some of you, you, you love being lied to. Well, how do you know that? Because you watch the six o'clock news every day. You want the preacher to tell you you're not going to have any problems in your marriage because God put you together. 
Just lies upon lies upon lies. And the bottom line is, saints, there's a war between heaven and hell and we're caught in the middle of it. There's a war going on between Christ and Antichrist and we're caught in the middle. And God's saying, I will reward you for any suffering, Christian suffering. I will reward you in the kingdom to come for any stand you make and you suffered. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of God. There's blessings that you'll receive in this life in maturity of character and there's blessings in the life to come for any suffering, any wrongdoing you've gone through that hurt you, hurt your family. God sees that and rewards are coming for you standing and after doing all to stand, you stand there. And don't stand there naked, get dressed in the armor of God. Some of, I, some of you, I love you, but you're charging hell with a water pistol naked. You are worse than a streaker <laughs> trying to defeat the devil in your life because you don't even know there's an armor. You don't know how to put it on. You don't know how to have your loins girt about with truth. You haven't even sold out to the truth. You're not willing to be rejected for the truth. You don't have a breastplate of righteousness on. Your righteousness vacillates according to political persuasions. You don't have God's righteousness that's eternal. That didn't come out right. We are all getting dressed and we're going to charge hell with a nuclear bomb. Hallelujah. By faith. Because we understand hope. We understand God's love and we're patient and we're allowing patience to be developed. Paul is talking about afflictions in this chapter and all these, again, tribulations. Verse 16 says, therefore we do not lose heart. Anybody been tempted to lose heart? I hate that to have to stand here and say, you know, there's times, man, that I get tempted to lose heart. But then I remember John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, I do, et cetera, et cetera. You have to make choices to let not your heart be troubled, to harness your heart, your emotions, your will. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. How many of you know you're getting stronger on the inside, even though you're decaying on the outside? And there's people that argue with me about this, but you're decaying on the outside. Look at your high school pictures. Some of you are fading fast. <laughs> Thank God I'm running out of time. Look at this, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. All these light afflictions, they're working something that's an exceeding eternal part of God's glory in your life. This really is good news, man. It's, it sounds kind of negative that... But it really, if you're listening, this is good news. This is every problem I'm going through when I submit to God, resist the devil. Something on the inside is growing and multiplying even though my outside is decaying. And this is interesting. I wish I had more time on this for sure. Paul said, our light afflictions, our. He called what he went through light afflictions. Some of you've read the Bible. Some of you've read 2 Corinthians chapter 10 or 11. It's one of those. It's 11. 2 Corinthians 10, 11, where he lists all of his light afflictions. Beat three times with rods right up to death. 
death's door three times, shipwrecked, a day and a night in the deep. And I'm telling you, I just about would rather take anything but a day and a night in the ocean. Dump, dump. And that'd be torment, man. There's stuff out there that'll eat you, hallelujah. Gets on an island and gets snake bit. He goes to jail multiple times. I don't know what's wrong with this. What Bible are we not reading? He, he, he goes to jail, innocent. He's innocent and imprisoned often. And he calls these light afflictions. He was stoned and left for dead. I'm talking about stoned. I'm not talking about what some of you have been stoned and left for dead by your friends. I'm talking about stoned. I've got some friends that were stoned and left for dead, so I didn't mean that towards you. It's like, do we picture this? Stoned to the point they think you're dead. And I read that stuff and I go, ah, my afflictions are super duper light afflictions. Right? But listen to everybody, even in the church, falling apart about some affliction. Some wrong that we've been done. <laughs> Man, this is good. I am preaching better than you're responding, but that's okay. That's okay. It is amazing how we don't have any patience. We don't understand the goal of faith and what's really happening when we're attacked. And he said, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The Bible t teaches you to quit looking at what you can see and look at what you can't see. Thank you. Y'all are so much further than I used to be. Because I used, my head would just spin. Because I don't know how you read the Bible, but I read it and I want to be obedient. I want, I want faith obedience. I want to understand it and I want to act on it because my faith without works is dead. And God's telling me, quit looking at what I can see. Okay, now look at what you can't see. <laughs> Bible psychobabble. And yet, how many Christians are looking more at what is so temporal and we see versus looking at what we can't see, the eternal promises and blessings and kingdom of God? You can't see God's kingdom with these eyes, but you can see it with the eyes of your heart. And the kingdom of God is suffering violence, but the violent take it by force. I'm, I'm gosh. I had so many other things, but let me quickly just give a quick testimony and let you go. Um, I was doing a decade of marriage seminars, at least two a year for a season, because God spoke to me about our homes. And he spoke to me about building a church and how to do that by building families. That's why I make no mistake about it. The attack on marriage is demonic. Because you can't have strong churches that impact cities and counties if you don't have strong families. And so the assault on the family and marriage and the nuclear family is by design, not by accident. So I was ministering on marriage. Well, I had to teach on romance and sex, which I'm not real comfortable with, which should be understandable by anyone within the sound of my voice. It just, it's just difficult. And so I was teaching on romance and then I thought, well, you know, I've got to act on some of this. I need to act on the romance side of my teaching better and Sue needs to act on the sex side. <laughs> so we both need to walk by faith. And so I need to work on this romance thing. And so, and so I got the bright idea that I'm gonna build Sue a fireplace in our bedroom because she loves fireplaces. 
And how many of you know, guys, you can witness to this. When you cut a hole in the roof, you're serious. <laughs> this is serious. So I cut a hole in the roof. Boy, I need to hurry with this because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> and so I bought this small little fireplace for this tiny little bedroom we lived in. And you got to understand, I'm from... Orlando, Florida, that's where I was born. And I didn't know what winter was. I didn't know what a fireplace was. I had never heard of a pre-soaked log. Now up here, everybody probably knows what a pre-soaked log is. So I get this little bitty fireplace in this little bitty bedroom and I buy some pre-soaked logs. And they were three pounds. And so I put a three pound pre-soaked log into the fireplace and lit it. But this is the night of romance. I'm expecting a big time payoff. I'm trying to speak over certain heads. And I want a fire. And this is not a good enough fire. So I put another three pound log and Sue goes, honey, I, I, I don't think you should put that extra log in there. And I just rebuked her. I said, this is my night of romance. This is my fire and I want a fire. <laughs> How many of you know what happened? I had a fire. <laughs> and then I couldn't control it. And so I ran into my my bathroom and I grabbed my sprayer that I use for my hair. <laughs> and so I'm spraying that fire and it was like charging hell with a water pistol. It, and Sue starts laughing and that makes me mad. <laughs> so I'm going to fix this fire. So I took the poker and I thought about spreading it out a little bit. So how many of you know what happened? I hit it and I ignited the gases and <laughs> fire started coming out and licking and going up the wall. And I'd hit it. <laughs> I had a fire and how many of you know romance went right out the door? <laughs> Sue's laughing at me. I'm, I'm really not happy. She goes and gets a pitcher of water and puts it out. That made me very unhappy. <laughs> How many of you know you've got the glory of Jesus himself on the inside of you? Amen. Listen, and when the devil strikes you with afflictions and trials and persecutions and opposition in his ignorance, he strikes you and ignites the glory of God on the inside of you that starts to come out of you that makes you effective in this world. Exodus chapter one, verse 12 says, the more that Pharaoh afflicted the children of Israel, they multiplied and grew. Amen. The biggest mistake that has ever happened by demonic powers and Satan himself on this planet was they struck Jesus on the cross. And in their ignorance, thought they had struck him with the blow of death. But how many of you know all they did was ignite the glory of God to fill the earth. And we are carriers now of that glory. I wanna encourage you the next time trouble hits, stop for a minute and think about what's really happening and you'll be able to count it all joy, amen. amen. Did anybody get anything today? Hallelujah, thank you God.